I want to begin with a quote. Um, this quote, I'm not necessarily taking aside, but I'd like us to think about what are the pros and cons of the issue um, that's going on. And, and let's back up and, and let's talk about diversity in society. Um, the timing of this talk couldn't be better. We have Ferguson going on. You all can help me with the list. We have Baltimore going on. We just had Charleston go on. And we have this huge debate about the Confederate flag. Has everybody been kind of familiar with that? So I just want to read you a quote from Brian France, the owner, founder, um, billionaire leader at NASCAR. This, is, this was his thoughts on diversity. And then I'll get into my talk. NASCAR chairman Brian France has acknowledged the flag's connection with NASCAR, but has his sights set on the future. Quote, obviously we have our roots in the South. There are events in the South. It's part of our history. Like it, like it is for the country, France said. But it needs to be just that, part of our history. It isn't part of our future. We want everybody in this country to be a NASCAR fan, and you can't do that being insensitive in any one area, end quote. So I'm from Orlando. I teach at UCF. I, I drove down here. I walked through the exhibit to your left. And the thing I took away is everybody's trying to get that edge, right? Whether it's a product, whether it's an approach to a performance. And diversity, I want to make the claim, is a part of that edge. So today, I'm going to focus on briefly my background and context with diversity and inclusion, social networking, upward mobility, the role of mentors and diverse leaders. I will not be able to get into sexual orientation, disability, um, global. I think some of the things I'm going to talk about will apply to global and international athletes, creating a pipeline, some final analysis and recommendations before our Q&A. So my background, so you know, is I got started on the coaching side. I coached at Cerritos College, a very diverse institution. Um, right now in 2015, uh, predominantly serves Hispanic communities and other groups as well, including whites. But you know, a funny story in terms of generational diversity, um, I think about my third year coaching, we were down 24 nothing. We came back and won the game, and after the game, all our players are singing the song. If you, it's around 93, they're singing the song. Whoop! There it is. Whoop! There it is. Because our coaches said that our team wasn't tough, and so none of our coaches that were from the baby boom generation had any idea what they were singing, and they said, "Keith, what are they singing?" I said, "Well, that's Whoop! There it is by Tag Team," and I bring that story up to say, when we'd have games on the road. Players would say, I want to hear country. I want to hear rock and roll. I want to hear rap or hip hop. And so coach put me in charge of diversifying the station. So I would, I would give everyone about 20 minutes from each genre. I bring that up to say, you have to understand the context that you operate in. So I did a re review of literature search before Scott and NSCA had me publish this career talk. And I wanted to know what are other folks talking about? So um, doctors Cartwright and Shingles talk about cultural competence, cultural awareness, cultural knowledge, cultural skill, and cultural encounters. And then Dr. Perrin, I was happy to see 15 years ago, wrote an article encouraging, challenging the membership, people like you that obviously value this topic and this in your toolbox to embrace diversity in terms of race and eth racial and ethnic diversity. I just want to get a little participation. What is one diversity issue that someone is brave enough to tell me that's going on in your environment right now that you have a concern with? Anyone? Yes. Right. So you get all of the African American issues. You're suspected to be the expert in residence, so to speak. OK. Any other issues generationally? Social economic status. OK? So one of the things I want to talk about related to your comment, comment is what do we do about getting a job? We have to get out here and network. We have how many people in attendance, Scott, at NSCA this year? Yeah. 1,500. 
And so one of the things I've done in my career is not only help students get jobs, but I do a lot of consulting on people that want to get in this game. These, as we know, these are very elite clubs, and they're what we call internal systems. So the only way you can crack an internal system is you have to have a networking strategy. And I've done a lot of work looking at different hiring trees in the NFL, in the NBA, um, in different leagues. Um, one of the most famous hiring trees is Bill Walsh's networking tree, and you can Google it's online. But I bring that up because everyone's walking around trying to enhance or increase their social capital. If you don't increase your social capital, you can't get a job. It was funny, I, right over on this other side to your left, there's a job board. And I always tell my students, and, and some of you may disagree with what I'm going to say, but we're here for diversity of thought. I said, if you all leave UCF's grad or undergrad, the Voss Sport Business Program, our minor or our grad program, and after 10 years of you out there in the game working full time, you're still logging on to teamwork online, you're still applying to jobs formally, I said, I failed. Me and Scott Buxton, Dr. Lapchick, Mike Redlick, we have failed. And what I'm getting at here is the research shows it's about who you know, but it's even stronger than that, it's who knows you. It's who is gonna pick up that phone when you need it. And so when we talk about diversity, one of the empirical findings by Day and McDonald, two scholars at North Carolina State, they found for white Americans in a predominantly white context, they can network within their own. That's clear with everyone, so to speak. For minority groups, in order to move up the ladder, they must network outside of their ethnic group. Is that clear with everyone? Because when I say that, I know when I mentor students, some of them, they get it, but they're like, they don't want to approach it that way. So in other words, at these conferences, everyone tends to, for the most part, you gravitate to who you know. You got to get outside your comfort zone. But then that's problematic because people, you know, Andrew just made a great comment. If you only have two women or maybe one, one or two people of color at your institution or organization, when you come here and you see 80 more faces that look like you, you want to network. So it doesn't mean that people of color are self-segregating. So I've lived through these things personally. I was the only African-American coach um, at my junior college for five years. And, and we would get into some very interesting discussions. Um, I can remember once one of our coaches start mimicking how a black player would talk on our opposing team. And I said, how do you know he talks like that? And this particular person was just caught off guard. And, and, and I bring that up to say that even when we network, we have to be real sensitive to the perspective that others are coming from. So related to that, the role of mentors, moving beyond stereotypes. This professor is actually a social work professor. And she is challenging athletic environments to move past the stereotypes. So let's just see by show of hands, because I still want some participation other than Andrew. OK. How many people deal with the sports of uh, football, men's and women's basketball? OK. What's your name? Yes. Carrie. 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 And wh which, which sports? Those three? Men's basketball. OK. And I'm not picking on you, Carrie. I'm just trying to foster some dialogue, since we have a smaller group. What are, what are some? stereotypes that you think your men's basketball players either hear about themselves or actually embrace? Good. In the community, how many people in that community? Just curious. 15,000. 15,000. And the demographics, I don't want to assume. It's probably 99% white. Okay. Kerry, thank you for sharing. And I want to ask anyone else in the group, I always get asked this question. Is it racist for them to assume, which I'm going to go out on a limb, I don't think it's racist to assume based on the demographics if they see an African-American male, are you a student athlete? Does anyone think that that's racist to assume that based on the demographics? I don't think it's racist. I think it's society driven. It's society driven. Say more. Sure. Well, and, and I laugh about it is I, I still, still to this day, every once in a while, if I speak at another campus, someone asks me, are you on the football team? And I'm like, I'm 47. If I got to get out there and ball, y'all are in trouble. 
okay? But it's a demographic thing, I want to make that point. I've done a lot of work on stereotypes. If you want to go into Google Scholar, and I am on student athletes not to reinforce them. I do a lot of diversity training. You know, right now I'm co-teaching a summer class at UCLA uh, with 18 students, and nine of them are freshmen. Three white males and six African Americans, including a guy named Cordell um, Broad, Snoop Dogg's son, is in the class who actually asked me to help him build his brand. I said, are you not communicating with your father? He's done a pretty good job of building a global brand. But um, Cordell is a, is a great young man. But we, we, we actually had a class in discussion. How could they decrease Kerry? And what's your first name? Yeah. Duke. Duke. Duke and Kerry, how, we, how do we decrease the stereotypes? I said, don't have your music on 10 or 12. Turn it down when you're on campus. You know, I, 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 I want to share with the group, I'm big on taking the high road. So whenever it's a crosswalk, I always let people walk fast. And I always start out my first class in diversity with, I don't know what it is, Duke, you brought it up about an African-American male, but I've seen people in their 90s when I'm trying to let them go and they eventually trust me. I mean, they, they're sprinting, they can't even walk because they think I'm gonna speed up and hit them. And I'm just like, like you, Duke, I'm not gonna run them over. I've worked too hard in my career to give it up to run over somebody walking across the street. So, how do we acknowledge the stereotypes and how do we also get the student athletes to hold themselves accountable? So, what I did in the article that Scott and the NSC had me write, I tried to look at the literature on race and talk about why is it diminished. Um, you know, we find that the tenure is shorter for groups of color, whether it be in something like a strength coach or a head coach, they kind of get one shot and then that's it. And in terms of gender, Sator Baldwin wrote this article that women, they didn't feel they didn't feel that they had effective mentors. And they also felt that not just the men don't reach out, but they don't feel that the women reach out as well to help them get mentored. How long have you been at that institution, Andrew? I'm just curious, 12 years. When you got there, how many women were there? Five. Five, okay. Okay. I'm not big on, you know, people say, well, what's the number? How many should you have? I don't know the answer to that. I just know that People want to work in this industry from different backgrounds, and they should be afforded the access to do it. So creating a pipeline. Um, when I told this, my class at UCLA this summer that I was going to do this talk, and, and later they, get, they all gave me suggestions, which NSCS, NSCA wanted me to talk about, strategies for coaches to interact in a multicultural environment a lot of them said quite, said quite naturally, what is the National Strength and Conditioning Association? Here they are on the full ride at UCLA, and they have no idea what it is. And a couple are interested in learning about it as a profession. So I would like us all to reach back and educate our student athletes about this group and the possibilities, because their careers are going to end. Athletes do not perceive these athletic contexts or sport business management areas as places they continue to work, can continue to work as leaders and managers of others. Teresa, why do you think that is? Our own student athletes don't think they can work in the very place that they've spent four to five years. I'm just curious what your thought is. I know it's my talk, but I want to get participation. And we know there are structural issues, too, regardless of their perceived ability. It is time consuming to balance different majors with your sport. So expose student athletes to vast range of possibilities that exist in this field and other related leadership roles. I mean, is it possible to have, you know, I just saw Joe Ken, a good friend of mine back during my Arizona State days when I was on the faculty. And, you know, I know he would do little things like have the player shadow what he does in terms of his professional role. Can, is, that, is that a policy we could have across the board? Just a thought. So I'm going to get into the suggestions, and then we can have more Q&A. So last year's conference theme was strength and innovation. The literature, which I pulled this from, talks about effective classroom instruction with new populations and clear strategies with LGBT and other populations. We know we just had a 
public policy ruling on same-sex marriage, forward in our thinking about the importance of diversity and inclusion. I think one challenge we have with diversity and inclusion is everybody defines it differently, and it is still tough to talk about it. I always say I wish we could talk about diversity and inclusion the way we talk about sport. You know, I told some friends, I've heard more about DeAndre Jordan deciding to go back to the Clippers versus the Mavericks than I have the other issues with the Confederate flag and other issues going on. We can talk about sport, but when it comes to race, gender, and class, people close up. And then focus on impl implementing a multicultural agenda and athletic training curricular on the analysis and associated benefits and outcomes of such educational strategies. So, what do we do? What do we do at the end of the day? And Scott, I thank you for pushing me with solutions, uh, but I don't think there are any easy solutions in this environment. So what I want to do, actually, I want to make sure everyone has this. Taylor Embry is a grad student at UCLA. He's a GA. His dad is John Embry. His dad was a former head coach at Colorado University for two years. Um, he got fired after two years. And Taylor was an All-American at UCLA. And he said, Dr. Harrison, I want to write an essay about solutions. I'm 27, 28 years old. I play in the NFL. I want to speak to the folks. So I just wanted to hand this out. And then I'll get into my recommendations. So I'm going to go through my recommendations, and then, then we can have an open dialogue. So one is become culturally competent of today's student athlete by studying and listening to their realities. Um, you know, some of my students in class ask me, Dot, you're not on Facebook. You're not on Twitter. I want to communicate with you. And I said, I'm kind of private. I, you know, just email me. But do we all agree that social media, the impact that it's had on today's student athlete, that they're more distracted? OK. Anything else affecting them? Poverty at times. You all help me out. What are some things with contemporary student athletes? Their identity issues. OK. Number two, acknowledge your own personal prejudice prejudices, biases, and stereotypes about your own ethnic group, both positive and negative. Self-awareness is key. That point was so important that my GA, Paige Gatsby, decided to put it twice, so we'll go to number four. Invite a player, student athlete, out to a cultural event outside of sport, museum, art festival, public lecture, movies, and engage your mentee of their life interests. My first year coaching in 1990, I was in grad school, and I'll never forget, I was only 22 years old, and one of my players was about 19 or 20. Um, he was from Florida. He, was, he had moved to Southern Cal, and the year before he was at Cerro's College, he played in a wishbone offense where they only had one or two pass plays, and we threw the ball a lot. And so as a young GA, I had to teach this guy how to pass block, who had only known two or three plays, and, and so many stories about Ruben. But anyway, um, you know, six, seven games into the season, we would go to Pizza Hut on Thursdays before a night practice. I got a little busy with grad school, uh, and actually it was a restaurant called Shakey's, and I remember he knocked on the office door and said, can, can I talk to Coach Keith? And he said, Coach Keith, how come you don't take me to lunch anymore? And I said, I've gotten a little busy with grad school. And he, and, and he said, Coach Keith, I don't care about the food. I'm missing the bonding. And I never forgot Ruben saying that. Ruben went on to graduate from San Jose State the same year his dad passed away. And so I know all of you have different stories. That's important. And I think it's a fine line. I'm not big on letting your guard down with them all the way because some of them will take advantage of you. But I think you have to let them know how real you are. Diversity is, is as much about what we do not know but are willing to learn from others without feeling guilty about the learning process and the learning curve to achieve equally. Um, I think my third year at Michigan, I taught my first grad course on diversity in sport. And one of our trainers, um, a gentleman that happened to be a white American, he shared a story in that class that he didn't understand at first why our players 
would get to training on Sundays, the day after the game with Michigan, always 10 minutes late, even though he told them to be on time. And then he found out later they really didn't want to be late, but they were all coming from church, a particular group. And after that, he said, okay, let's start at 10 after 10. And that's a little thing, but I think it's important related to that. Create a shirt or hat that emphasizes a, di a diverse and inclusive environment through teamwork. You know, my, my fourth year coaching, I made a shirt that said, it's not a black thing, it's not a brown thing, it's not a white thing, it's an O-line thing. And so I tried to empower the particular group, the offensive line that I was coaching. Bring in former players from different backgrounds. Do any of you bring former players back to talk to your current student athletes? Okay, I think the value in that is them hearing it from someone who has been successful and gone out there. Include that diversity of thought is equally as important as diversity of skin color, social class, gender, sexual orientation, and encourage different views on various topics. Survey your student athletes at the end of each semester on suggestions that they have. And then probably one of my favorites where I get laughed at, they say, if you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? I have a picture from my junior year, and I literally have a kid in play, those of you who remember the rapper, high top fade with the part. I keep it in my office for students and student athletes, and actually some of my faculty members who might not understand that I used to have hair either, but adorn your, your, your office with this. Any of you have any photos in your office back in the day? Just curious. Okay, I'm like 0 for 4 with my survey. Um, but you'd be surprised how, how, how important that is to them. Because otherwise, they really don't think you can get in their shoes. They look at you as an old person. Give your student athletes reading materials on positive stories of diversity and inclusion happening every day in our world and put them on the bulletin board. 